So let's dive in today. Here we are at this series called Grace Unleashed. And every year we have to have this series. We have to have a series that we're reminded, why are we here? What matters most? What is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of my life as a follower of Jesus? What is our real main purpose? And Jesus didn't complicate it. He said it's simply this, the great commandment and the great commission. Great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There's two things said there. That's worship and it's just ministry, serving one another. And then he says in the great commission, which we see in Matthew 28, he said, originally all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, that's evangelism, and make disciples of all nations. He didn't limit it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey or to observe everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. One of the things in there, he says, baptizing them. We've got baptism coming up in a few weeks' time. If you've not been baptized, we do full immersion baptism here. We believe biblically that's what baptism is, and we believe baptism always follows belief. We see that in the Scriptures. So if you have not been baptized yet, declare yourself, he is my King and King Jesus, and you want to associate with him and declare what he called us to do, baptism is coming up. We have a class to explain all about that in two weeks' time. You can engage with us, go to Connection Point afterwards or connect with us online and get registered for baptism at the end of October. We'll be baptizing again. And you always know it's an incredible moment. Don't miss out. Last week, I kind of laid a foundation for the whole series by talking about inviting Jesus into your storms. How's it gone this week? How's it gone? How's it been going uh, this week, inviting him into your storm? Maybe your storm has subsided this week. Maybe it's got worse. But he is good, and he is there, and he does care. Inviting him in. And so I said, this series, what I wanted to do is pick up the main purposes as a church. We remember this by using the word grace, grow, reach, adore, connect, and engage. They're them whole heart of discipleship and evangelism and worship and fellowship and serving ministry. That's the whole purposes of where we are. But I wanted us to look specifically at how Jesus unleashed grace. We're going to stay in the Gospels and see what Jesus did and look at moments where Jesus is right there and grace is unleashed by him and people receive it and experience it. And today we're going to do the same thing, but the main thing is this word grow, which is all about the word discipleship. Let me ask you a question. You can answer it in your head. How many years would you say you've been a disciple of Jesus? Interesting you use that word like disciple. We have always different words for disciples of Jesus. Words can be good. They can also be time-centric. They can go out. They can mean different things as time goes on in culture. Maybe you'd use the word, well, I'm a Christian, therefore. Does the word Christian in our culture today mean what I believe the word Christian means? I mean, really, the Christian was kind of a nickname given to these followers of Jesus, these little Christs, as they were nicknamed. But is the word Christian a thing? Is Christianity this religion now? And how is that viewed? Is the word Christian there? I know for me, for all my majority of my years in ministry in a post-Christian culture, the word Christian did not mean what I believed it meant. You could say, well, I'm Christian because I'm not any of the other faith systems. And, and I live in a country which may, that may have been a, his, so I'll check the Christian box on a census. But it doesn't necessarily mean I'm a disciple of Jesus. Maybe use the word believer. Oh, he's a believer. Believer in what? He's a believer in God. Okay. The scriptures say, Hey, you believe in one God. Good. But even the demons believe that and shudder. 
So is the word believer, is that, or am I just playing like semantics with words? But, but how, what does this look like? What does it mean to be a disciple? Maybe it's, oh yeah, you go to church, I go to church. Oh, okay, maybe you're a Christer. That's Christmas and Easter for those people. Maybe that's what it is. But, but oh, I go to church. I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with somebody in the gym and they, they found out I was a pastor, which I always let them find out. I never tell them. Because if I tell them, they don't talk to me. No, seriously. And they found out, I know which church is it. Oh, yeah, I, I go to church. Oh, you do, do you? Which church? And they had to think about the name of it. There's an, oh, and I'm like, oh, I know where you're at. They had to, I said, well, where is it? I told them the name of the church that they go to. It's interesting to see it. What does that look like? Even the word follower is now being uh, hijacked a little bit. And I want to sit with that name anyway. The word follower, people want to gain followers on their social media. I have all these followers. They follow me. Do they really? They look at your pictures. But are they like you? Are they following you in your example? And what is it that I portray on there? Do, is that what I want them to follow, but not really who I really am? Don't follow the real me. Follow the projected me, fake me. But today, I just want to declare this. This is something which I believe, because of our culture being far more de-churched, unchurched, post-Christian now, we should, words do matter. And so when, say, to say the word, oh, I'm a Christian, I want to get back to what Jesus was calling us to be, and I want to define again, practically, what is a disciple? Seriously, what is a disciple? And some of you maybe have called yourself a disciple for many years. I'm going to help you go there today. I'm going to help you measure that today. I'm going to help you be inspired with that today. I'm going to help you, hopefully, to want to grow in that today. Because it's everything. It's everything. And so I would use, when I was going to public high schools all around England, and I wouldn't say, oh, I'm a Christian, because they go, well, that, there's a different definition. I'd have to make it different. I'd have to say, look, Jesus is my king, and I am a follower of King Jesus. I wouldn't say I'm a Christian. I'm saying, my life, I am a follower of King Jesus. What does that look like? Well, I'm hoping that I'm a follower of King Jesus in every sphere of my life. In everything, in everything that I do, everything where I go, then that should be defined by, as a follower of King Jesus, this is how I therefore live. Just defining that, and I like it, because the definition of discipleship, my favorite, okay? I'm not saying this is the only one. But I can clearly say it because it's the words of Jesus. Matthew 4, 19. You've heard me say this many times. I will keep saying it many times because it's everything. It's so important to define if what is a disciple. And some of you in today may discover that you're currently not by what I talk about today. But the invitation will still be there. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 4, 19. He is calling his disciples. Now, every rabbi in those days would find a Talmud. He would find disciples. Their purpose was to learn from their rabbi. And when their rabbi moves on, they pass on his yoke, his teachings. That's what they were to do. They were to become like him and take that on board. And every rabbi would have their interpretation and their development and what they saw the scriptures say and be inspired. So that wasn't unusual. But to be a disciple, Jesus picks these guys. Long story cut short, he picks the rejects. He picks the guys who weren't good enough and doesn't make the grade. And then he says this phrase and it defines what is a disciple. He says, come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. So let me just define this. What is a disciple? A disciple is not just somebody who believes in who Jesus is. Because demons believe that. Jesus says, come follow me. Question, am I following Jesus in every sphere of my life? Come follow me. And it's an invitation. Here's step one of grace being unleashed. You don't deserve it. You cannot earn it. <laughs> he invites you to follow him. He invites you to follow him. Wow. 
come follow me. Step one, I'm a follower of Jesus. Step two, and I will make you, he says. I will make you. That's an English translation. There's the key word, transformation. Transformation takes place. Change. When you follow Jesus, you will, you should be coming more like him. You'll be changed. There's transformation that takes place. There's a working in relationship, walking with Jesus that he then corrects and rebukes and encourages. And there's a transformation that takes place. Therefore, your home should change. Your work should change. Your marriage should change. Your health should change. Everything about you changes when you follow King Jesus. Come follow me. I will make you. I'm being changed by Jesus Disciple is somebody who follows Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, constantly being changed. And thirdly, fishers of men, you join Jesus on his mission. So to define a disciple is these three things. So are you a disciple of Jesus? If so, are you following Jesus in every sphere of life? Are you being changed by Jesus in every sphere of your life, and have you joined Jesus on his mission of making disciples? Because if I'm not making disciples, I'm not on his mission. Therefore, am I a disciple if I'm not on his mission? Because a lot of us start here and we stop here. I'm following Jesus, I'm following Jesus, but where's the change? And where's the mission that he's called you to? So super quick today, Let me ask you a simple question. Do you want to grow? This middle piece here, change. Do you want to grow? Duh. No, seriously, do you want to? Or are you quite content where you are right now? You could say your walk with Jesus, whatever phrase you want to walk. Do you want to be closer to him? Do you want to follow him better? Do you need to be changed by him in certain aspects? Because you do. And do you want to grow in such a way that you join him on his mission and you bear fruit, fruit that will last? Do you want to grow? I'm going to define this again. We're going to get to a scripture today. Don't worry. We're going to get there, but I need to lay a foundation. There are different stages in human development, agreed? We have babies born, infants, then we have children, then we have adolescence into young adulthood, and then you have independent adulthood going into parents for many people. And when you become a parent, what do you do? you are able to be part of the blessing to give birth to an infant who becomes a child, who becomes a young adult, who becomes a parent, who becomes an infant, who becomes a child. You get it? Now, in discipleship, in following Jesus, it's interesting the Scriptures talk in that way as well. It talks about newborn babies and it talks about maturity. So let me ask you a question. I wonder where you are development-wise in following Jesus. Which stage are you at in life? You see, if you're a brand new believer, you're an infant. And here's the blessing that when you're an infant, ignorance is your friend. You don't know what you don't know. You're brand new to it and you don't know. You can make mistakes because you don't know. But what you do know is, all of a sudden, this is who my father is. I'm a child of God. And I've been saved forgiven, restored, redeemed, set free. My eternity is now so exciting, no longer fearful. That's who I am. You're a baby, and this is awesome. And you're craving food. Bible say craving's pure spiritual milk. You're craving it. That's where you are. Maybe that's where you are right now. Keep going there. But but you can't stay there. That'd be weird. Oh, I just come to church and just keep feeding me. I don't want to feed myself. Just, ah, ah. That'd be weird if you've been doing that for a long time. This is Dennis children. Now, children, if we're to define childish behavior, it will be defined in one word, which some of us don't grow out of. Selfishness. Agreed? I want this. I demand this as a child. A child is me, 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 me. I need this. Give it to me. I still need my parents, but then I demand of them. I need it. I want it. I like it this way. I like it that way. I want this. I want that. I'm not being harsh here, 
for the overwhelming majority of the Western church is children still. I'm just saying it. Because that's what we see. I'm a child. This is what I want. And if I don't get it, I'll go find it somewhere else. I want it, I want it, I want it. Give me, give me, give me, give me. This is me. Yeah, I'm following Jesus, but the change piece, I'm just going to stay as a child. And it's the church's fault if I don't get what I want. I don't like this, I want this, I want this. And give me, give me, give me. And discipleship is defined by how good the teaching is to me. Hmm, interesting. The next stage is this young adulthood life where there's an element of I'm following Jesus. I've grown out of being child self-centered and now my life revolves around <gasps> all of a sudden there's a maturity and my life is more God-centered and I'm now others-centered. It goes there. Oh, now we're cooking. Now they're on, and they're on this mission. And this is great. And there's a craving there. And at such a point, that desire is so strong, they become parents. They become parents, and they're able to nurture infants again and want to see them go and grow. And they become a parent. And that's the point. And that's where we are. So where are you in that? Be honest. And it's quite easy to define, especially the last two. The, the first two were quite easy to define. But where are you in that? See, growth, do you want to grow, requires change. And change always involves discomfort. At whatever level you want to call it. Sometimes it's pain. Sometimes it's a shift in my life, in my convenience. Change is, in the essence of the word, defines you have to change. And so from that, there's discomfort. And that's why so many people don't grow. Because they don't want to grow. Look, there they do. No, they don't. They, they want to grow on their terms. They're still like children. I, I, this is what I want. Give me this, give me this, and it will just happen. No, it won't. It has to be intentional. Because that's what adult life is about. Choices and being intentional. And so if we say, King Jesus, my life is yours, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, where do I sit in that? Discipleship is all about transformation. That's what it's all about, to become more and more like Jesus. And so when Jesus says, here's my grace and I'm unleashing it, it's never about legalism. It's never about knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's never about just rule keeping. It's all about closer walk with him in relationship, receiving his grace, and then unleashing his grace. See, maturity, if you want to measure it, is somebody else who is discipling somebody else. That's a mature believer. Somebody who is investing in somebody else's life to become more like Jesus. That's a sign of maturity. So you could have been following Jesus for three weeks and you've invested in somebody else, and you're more mature than those who've been following Jesus for 50 years and have never discipled anybody, only been in a room to get discipled. Maturity isn't about years on the Jesus continuum. It's about, am I following him? Am I being changed on him? And am I, have I joined him on his mission? So today, that wasn't an introduction. That was a foundation lay. Okay, so when I review this, where did I waste my time? It wasn't in the introduction. Now let's go to a section of Scripture today, which may be a little out of the box on this subject, but it helps us see Jesus, see how Jesus interacts with some of his disciples, their response to it. We see his grace to it, and then what's our response going to be to it? Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. That's near the end of the Gospel of Mark, so we're near the end of Jesus' life on this earth. Mark 14. This encounter is also in Matthew and in Luke, so we can go there. I'm going to go to Mark 14, verse 32 to 42. I'm going to go through it all, verse by verse, but I'm going to sit on some sections and breeze through some others. Why? Just because of time, but because there's an emphasis that I believe the Spirit has caused in me this week to go reveal this to the people. Mark 
chapter 14. It'll be on screen if you've not brought your Bible or you don't have a Bible with you. And that's, here we go. 14, verse 32. They, that's they, this is Jesus and his disciples. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Now we know from the Luke account that Jesus was so in despair that he sweats beads of blood. There's a desperation beyond desperation. This is what it is. Little subtle things, again, slow down reading your Bible. The word Gethsemane, in its purest form, the place Gethsemane means oil press. Hmm. There's something in that. I'll let that stay with you. Maybe it's, what's he talking about? Deliberately put it out there, make you hungry. He goes to the oil press. He takes with him Peter, James, and John. Ah, Jesus had favorites. How rude. He takes Peter, James, and John with him a few times in his life. Have you noticed that? It's Peter, James, and John. It's Peter, James, and John. What are the other nine thinking? Oh, here he goes again. Hate Peter, hate James, hate John. So nervous. I mean, no, I don't know, but he does. What's going on here? I want to say this to you. For Jesus, investing in 12 was enough. But he had an inner circle. He had an inner circle that for some reason, and God knows a reason, he invested in them and he revealed to these guys things he wanted them to see, to experience, and to know. He did. He had an inner circle. And what gets me with this is a couple of things. First of all, Peter, James, and John, three guys. The word three is, number three is the number of completion. Throughout the scriptures, if you were to do a study of three things combined, it would blow your mind. We start with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then we go, resurrection happened on the third day. Then we have faith, hope, and love. Then we have a cord of three strands cannot easily be broken. There's so many different things of three going on, and there's these three guys, and even in this text today, you'll see three. You'll see a first time, a second time, and a third time something take place. It's all going on. It's rich. I'm just saying there is something about following Jesus that you just never get to the full depths of how awesome he is. How hungry are you? Do you want to grow? Do you want to still discover after following Jesus for four years, for 40 years, for 80 years, where are you? I've had seasons in my life where I've been all in intense, cannot get enough. And I'll admit, I've had times where I've gone, just cooled off a bit. Cooled off a bit. Maybe you've heard the phrase, people backslide. I don't personally believe that is biblical. Ooh, get it. I don't believe I backslide. I believe I move from God. I'm good now. I'm walking with him, and I go, leave it to me. I need to return to him in repentance. Interesting phrase. But for me in my life, when things have gone cold, it's always needed me to repent and return to him because I've gone, I'm good, Jesus, I can deal with this myself. Maybe not intentionally, subconsciously I have in some way. But where are you right now in this journey, these three things? And interesting, Peter, James, and John are invited by Jesus into, at this point in time, the darkest hour of his life. He wants them to see and be with him in the darkest hour of his life. They want to see his humanity. They want to see his flesh grown with pain. 
And he wants them also to see his response to that. If you're going through a season right now, maybe it's the storm situation or some pain, let me ask you a question. Why should I follow Jesus? He's saying, come follow me, but why should I? Here's one reason why. He knows your pain. He's sat in pain. He's sat in loneliness. He's sat in despair. He's sat in injustice. He sat in rejection. He sat in hurt. He sat in grief. He sat in hope. He sat in a why. He sat there. Come follow me. I want to follow one who knows. He knows. It's a beautiful image that we see going on. It's a beautiful image. Let me ask you a question. Who are you walking with? Peter, James, and John, who who are you walking with? As in following Jesus with? Who's in your inner circle? Who do you have in your life that can see your darkest moments and be there? Who do you have who's able to say, hey, I know, let me, I can see this. I I can be Jesus' hands and feet for you right now because that's what the body of Christ can be. Who who are you walking with? Who are you with? Because if it's just connecting with believers on a Sunday in this environment, you're going to starve. Who are you walking with? And then he goes on. Verse 35. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Even Jesus, wow. Did he fall to the ground in a conscious controlled fall or did the sheer burden of the whole thing cause him to fall to the ground? I'm gonna go for the latter. Going a little further, I can't take it anymore. And we know where he was going and why he went there. This is his grace being unleashed for you before you realized it. This is how much he loves you. And it was so overwhelming. He was like, if there's another way, Father. And he knows it, but but he's just honest in it. It's honest. In your prayer time, are you being honest or are you trying to just say the right things to God hoping to get the right answer? I don't know what your prayer life's like if you pray. But honesty is key. I mean, he already knows, just to let you know that one. You can't fake it with God. It's God. But just to bring that, he wants you to bring how you're feeling really Really? And he goes on and he says this, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. That phrase is a discipleship sentence of modeling by Jesus. It's not about me. And yet he loves me. Not what I will, but what you will, God. I'm following you in every sphere of life, and I will go wherever you tell me to go, Jesus. Not what I will, but what you will. I know that's going to involve me changing, Jesus. Will you help me change this one? What is it I need to stop doing, start doing? What do I need to reset? Maybe my following Jesus, it's got routine, it's got stale. Maybe you need to switch it up a little bit. Maybe you need to do something about that. You can plateau, can't you, in all spheres of life. And you just have to just switch some things up. Sometimes you just have to bring a change just because that change brings about a different awareness. Sometimes you just have to move seats, both physically and practically and metaphorically. Sometimes that's what you just need to do. Sometimes some of you maybe need to change the time of day that you do your quiet time, whatever that means. 
your devotional time, the time where you sit with the Lord, maybe open the scriptures and have time of worship. Maybe some of you need to switch it up and stop doing that completely and punctuate it throughout your day. Ooh, what do you mean? No, 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 I'm just saying, what, what is it you need to do? Maybe you need to set your alarm 15 minutes earlier. Later, I, I've, in different seasons of life, you know it, as a young adult, when you know responsibilities whenever I want. Last thing at night, first thing in the morning. Maybe when you get to become a parent and you have children and babies, forget the alarm, they are the alarm. Oh, that doesn't work anymore. How do I go about that one? How, how, how do I go about it? I'm just telling you right now, when my children were very, very young, I had no quiet time at home. It was the first portion of my day at my desk. Now, I'm blessed in the job I was in, I had that freedom. Do you know, but whatever it may be, maybe it's your commute in your car, but whatever it may be, but I, it matters. Maybe it's the seat you sit in, get a new one. Change the view. What, maybe it's get outside, whatever it may be need to be, it matters so much for him to speak to me, to change me, because the reason is he has a mission that he's calling us to fulfill and to be part of, and am I on it? And what's it gonna take for me to be on it? Verse 37, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? And aside, raise your hands if you've ever fallen asleep praying. Raise your hands. I haven't got enough hands, personally. Raise your hands if you've ever fallen asleep praying. Can I just let you out on the guilt on this one? What an awesome way to fall asleep. No, I'm serious. Don't ever feel the guilt of that. And the enemy going, what an incredible way to fall asleep. Communing with your father. Those of you who've been parents and you've held a little child and you talk to them and you fall asleep, you go, how dare you? How dare you fall asleep? I was talking to you. No, you go, ah. Little aside, she's not here right now, but my wife often, when she's struggling to sleep at night, will say, can you talk to me? Just talk to me. Because it helps her fall asleep. <laughs> I'm serious. I just talk, and, and there's a moment, mid-sentence. She, she'll, she'll, that's true. She'll confess that one. Am I cross? Am I, how dare you? No. So just, let me just, just like, hey. Now, if you only pray for five seconds every day and it ends up when you've fallen asleep, there's an issue. But what a great way to fall asleep. Let me just release that. And I've, I really felt that this week to say that to some of you. All right? I, re I really do. It's such a, a beautiful image to go with. So he says this and he says, hey, verse 38. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. What a verse that is. That, that today was like, well, boom. That was like, oh. Watch and pray so you won't fall into temptation. Can I get that? Focused on Jesus. Temptation comes knocking. I'm focused on Jesus. I'm going to choose Jesus because I'm focused on Jesus. And I have temptations and we all have temptations. Jesus had temptations. What do we do with it? All them things can take place. Watch and pray. I get that. But then he adds, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. This is a dynamic in discipleship, which is why you shouldn't be doing it alone. And this is where the transformation and the change takes place. There's, the Apostle Paul articulated, didn't he? He articulated it. The very things I want to do, I find myself not doing. The very things I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing. What a wretched man I am. I'm like, yes. Even the Apostle Paul's like me. Or I'm like him. There is a war going on. You know that. There's a war going on. The flesh and the spirit. There's a war going on. There's a battle raging, and Jesus says, now, I'm not going to get into it today because what we're doing now for all of our small groups, 
Off the Sunday message, we're creating questions and studies. So if you're in a small group, there's one of the major options we do that. And I sit down in the week, and me and Josh, and we walk through, and we create questions that we believe are going to help illuminate and help us dive into this a bit more. Extra cross-referencing for those who want to do deeper Bible dig, but a lot of life application. What does it look like, feel like, mean like for one another in this? And number five question of this week's is to do with this whole thing of the temptation deal and talk about the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. I could probably write a book from my life experience and I'm sure you could, but what does that sit like, feel like? It's wow. How many times have you gone, why did I do that? What was I thinking? But there's a dynamic there that in discipleship with one another in you can take place. I'm going to leave that with you. We carry on. Verse 39. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. Wow, he prayed again. Father, if possible, yet not my will, but your will. He's told his disciples, sit here while I pray. Then he said, watch and pray so you won't fall into temptation. Verse 40. When he came back, he again found them asleep. He again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. <laughs> It's nighttime. They're tired. It's all right. They're there. It's, they're under the stars. They fall asleep. No biggie. But he's just saying, following Jesus. You see, this is loaded. It's so loaded. The scriptures are so rich. You're following Jesus. And sometimes, <sighs> now, moving on. They did not know what to say to him. What an interesting line. We, we were just tired, Jesus. We tried. Wow. What was Jesus' tone in this? Was it a striking, harsh tone? Or was it a gentle tone? I don't know, but Jesus comes and goes, I've asked you to do something. You didn't quite do it, did you? They didn't know what to say to him. Like, they didn't even... Do we say sorry? Do we, but how, wow, what you're asking us was really hard. Like, was it that bad? I mean, we're still here. We're still here. Verse 41. Returning the third time, doo -doo -doo -doo, third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Oh, resting, fine. Enough. Done now. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now we know this is at the end of the three years of Jesus discipling his disciples, but what a discipleship moment. What a discipleship moment that Jesus is sitting with his with his disciples here in this time, the third time. When we disciple people or we are discipled by Jesus and it is grace-filled, you crave more. When it's legalism-filled and rule-filled and earn this and you're bad, but when it's grace-filled and Jesus is grace-filled, on theory you could say, they let Jesus down three times. And he could have gone, in my darkest hour, you couldn't even stay awake. Off with you. I'll deal with this all by myself. But no, they're on his mission and he invites them into that next chapter of the mission, which at this point in time was the moment in the mission. Now, we even know from verse, which is not on the screen, and verse 31 of Mark 14, the verse before, said, but Peter insisted emphatically, because he said, you're going to deny him. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. No, emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And it says this, and all the others said the same. They all said we will never disown you. Peter gets the the stick for it, didn't he? They all said it. 
And yet he's still with grace. I know. Come. Come with me. Come. C come enter into this next season, this next chapter. There's a fight here. We're going to engage in some war. So let me get practical with this right now. Oh, wow, I'm already over time. That, I have a clock up here. And when the numbers at the bottom turn red, it's meant to be stop. I'm not going to stop because this is an important piece. What is your discipleship story? Hmm, what does that mean, Des? Well, let me ask you a question. Who in your life has discipled you? Maybe it was for a week, a month, a year, for decades. Who do you have feeding into you? That maybe isn't that difficult to question. Now, if there's nobody, then there's an action step that you need to take. But maybe you can remember, this is what did me, but here's the bigger one. Who is it that you are discipling? Because, of, because what is discipleship? I'm following Jesus, I'm being changed by Jesus, and I'm on Jesus' mission, which is make disciples. That's what it is. It doesn't say go and make converts. It says go and make disciples. Who make disciples? Who make disciples? Well, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know who that is. Well, I'm just telling you, our college ministry is only four weeks old, and it's at 150 college kids right now. I don't know about you, college kids think they know everything. I have them in my house. But they crave wisdom. They crave somebody who will invest in their lives. I've had that in my life. It's so important. You have a divine calling to make disciples. The question isn't today for many of you, and for some of you it's a little bit, isn't who do I need? Who do I need in my life right now to disciple me? That could be a valid question, but for some of you who've been following Jesus for many years is who needs you? Who needs you? Who needs you to walk alongside them? to help them grow from infants to children to young adults so they in turn become a parent one day and go and grow. Who needs you? So, do you want to grow? Do you want to grow? Is he King Jesus? If he is, question number one, are you following him in every sphere of life? Look at your whole life right now and go, do you know what? I'm not following Jesus in this sphere of my life. In this particular part, I'm, I'm not inviting him into it, and he's not king in it. Are you following Jesus in every sphere? Number two, are you growing? Are you changing? Are you transforming? What is the Lord asking of you at the moment? What is he leading you towards? What is he asking you to stop, to start? Is that conversation even there? What is your engagement walking with him like? Is it real and vibrant? Has it gone cold and stale? There are seasons in spiritual soul life. I understand all of that. But who are you engaging with that conversation? Who are you in community with? Maybe for some of you, your action step is go join a small group. So we have messages like this today and you've somewhere this week to go and process that. You've somewhere to go and dialogue that. Somewhere to go and maybe learn from somebody else who's been in a similar season to you and how are they getting through it or somebody in the same season as you that you can sit with them in it. It's in, this is it. This is, every, this is what we're meant to be doing. And you're on his mission. Are you making disciples? Are you making disciples? Who is Jesus to you? Is he King Jesus? Are you a believer, a Christian? I go to church or are you? No, he is my king and I am a follower of King Jesus in every sphere of my life, in every sphere of my life. A reminder, some of you, the next step is obedience, get baptized. I'm saying that again, get baptized. That's a thing. Maybe for some of you, you've recognized in them stages of growth in a disciple, you've been sat being childlike for way too long. And that was never meant to be. It's time to grow up. And embrace that. I'm not getting you wrong. Wasn't life awesome when you were nine? The worries, the thoughts, the... Oh, which is why so many 
Christians sit as spiritual children because everything's there for me. But that'd be weird in normal human behavior. So the Lord's calling you up today. I'm going to pray for us today because it wasn't particularly, oh, wow, this was an electrifying kind of a deal. No, this was a Jesus call today. Are you following him? Are you being changed by him? And have you joined him on his mission? Because that's what a disciple is. All three or none at all. And so as we sing all hail King Jesus today to end, and we sing his gospel story, his story is for you to retell. His story is for you to live out. His story is for you to proclaim. And it's freedom bringing. And so I want to invite you right where you are today. I'm not going to do, I'll come down the front, do all of this. And, but after the service, we'll have some prayer partners available for you. If there's a situation where you just feel, I say this word, a blockage. A blockage. I need someone to pray with me to help me break through in following Jesus. And maybe for some of you, it's that first time. I've never fully given him my everything. Please come down afterwards with one of our prayer partners. Let's lead you in that. In that moment of you hearing him say, come follow me. Let's do that afterwards. But I want to lead us in a time of prayer right now. For wherever we are in this growth journey of following Jesus. King Jesus, I give my life to you today. That my life is your life. And I pray for everybody in this room and for all of those online listening in. I pray right now that we, we hear afresh your call to follow you, to be changed by you and to join you on your mission. And Lord, would you encourage us today because you do it with grace. You say, it's okay. You cannot earn it. You do not deserve it. But I love you so much. But come. Come now. Listen to me and walk with me. I pray that for many in this room today, their next step is, I need to walk with others. Not just because I need them, but they need me. I pray they take the next step and they ask that question maybe joining a group. For some, it's time. It's time to invest in the next generation. It's time to be a disciple who in turn can make disciples. Lord, I pray that you, I stand against the, the enemy saying to you, you don't know enough, you're not good enough. No, you've lived life following Jesus, share that. So Lord, you qualify us you always seem to qualify the unqualified. And so, would you enable that in us as well today? And would you reignite in us the desire to walk with you richly? Lord, for some of us in this room, we want to grow. Come speak to us. We will obey your voice. We love you, Jesus, with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And you call us to love our neighbor as ourself. King Jesus, you tell us to go and make disciples of all nations. So here we are. You told us to go. We're going to go. Here I am. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.